So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, March the 18th, and this is episode number 151 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below and you'll see line item by line item what's going on. And you'll find the link to the podcast on Podbean, The Way to Be. And I have a special announcer this morning. Welcome to another episode of The Way to Be. So there's that. That's my grandson right there. Wanted to make sure and let you know what's going on. So in the opening sequences, we had the bees going to dry pollen substitute. And a lot of people wanted to know what the pollen sub is that they're going after. And it's Ultra Bee, dry pollen sub for Man Lake. So you can find it. You can Google it. We're running out of time for the bees to be using that because the trees are blossoming. So the bees hopefully will soon find real pollen and real nectar and things like that. But if you've got dry pollen subs sitting around and uh, you're in a dearth period before the bees are flying and the weather's warm, 70 degrees right now, which is 21 Celsius, sunny and then overcast. So intermittent cloud cover, but the bees are flying everywhere. Great opportunity for them to really get things kicked off and my satellite apiary, satellite hive, to the north is also doing really well without any help at all. So what else is going on? Uh, let's get into, oh, before we do anything else, let's see. Nope, I think that's it. So the very first question comes from Corey Scanlon. Uh, I'm looking to start back here beekeeping and interested in the Slovenian AZ hive setup. I like the appeal of the hive design and the ability to eventually put them in a small bee house at some point. And have you tested any of these designs or provide any information about pros and cons if available? So here's the thing. No, I have not. But I do like the idea of having hives in buildings. That's what an observation hive is. After all, you just run a tube to the outside. And uh, so, but it conflicts with some of the things that I'm also trying to do, which is provide a lot of separation from the hives to cut down on bee drift. So if you're wondering what bee drift is, it's when the foragers are out and when they come back, they land on the wrong landing board. And then because they're full of resources, they get welcomed on board and off they go, potentially spreading disease and pathogens and things like that. Plus you lose your bees to other colonies. So you lose your foraging force to some degree. And that's why when you put a bunch of beehives side by side together, all looking the same in a single row, you end up with heavier populations in the end colonies. So that's the one thing that comes to mind right away when you see these uh, Slovenian hives. Uh, because they're in a building. Often it's portable. And sometimes it's a vehicle that transports them around, which probably makes it pretty darn convenient when it comes to doing pollination services and things like that, although you're parking the vehicle there. You're not just leaving the hives. But huge bonus to it that I see is that you get to walk inside and the whole place is set up, so it looks pretty cozy for the beekeeper. And I can imagine with all the hives put together in one building, that uh, they somewhat warm the building and uh, you're out of the weather, which means you can expect inspect hives no matter what the weather's doing, which for people with their bees out in the yard, you're looking for doing inspections on nice warm days when the sun is up and you want to do them in mid afternoon if you can do it because you want the sun nice and high so you can really see down inside the hive, see between the frames and things like that. You also want most of the foraging force to be out, which reduces the number of bees you're going to be dealing with. So what I thought I would do, and again, no, I don't have one, but uh, in the building that I'm putting up now, I plan to have multiple hives inside the building, but they'll be spaced out, and then their entrances will be going in a number of different directions. So another thing that I was thinking about is if we had, because I was thinking, well, you could really do it with uh, just a Langstroth hive. If you've got one of those Amish-built sheds or something, you've got a small barn, and uh, I talked to some of my friends who have old dairy barns with great big haylofts in them. I talked them into putting their beehives up in the hayloft. And then you've got just an inch and a half diameter opening going out. So they just modify the entrance to the hive. So they don't have a normal landing board. They just run the tube from the hive right out through the sidewall. 
And now that thing is like 18 to 20 feet off the ground, so no predators. Uh, no snow piling up against the entrance, so no cleanouts necessary. And again, the ability to inspect those hives no matter what the weather's doing. So I plan to do something a little bit like that, but you'll still be lifting those boxes off so that you can do inspections well. When it comes to the AZ hive setup, there's no more box lifting because you pull the back door open and you pull the frames out one by one and you look at them and you're not lifting them. Plus, it's inside a building where a lot of people have also set up their uh, uncapping harvesting equipment and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. And normally what I do is I wait until the very end of my Q&A to give a shout out to another website. Well, today I'm not going to wait till the end. That's right, I'm going to give a shout out right now. Because one of the things I wanted to do with the shout outs is either encourage a new young beekeeper that's trying to get going and could use some words of encouragement and support from other beekeepers around the world, or someone who's got a response or a video that very well details something that matches up with a question. So this matches up with a question. That's why we're doing it right now. The YouTube channel is called Drebbyville Hives. D-R-E-B-B-I-E-V-I-L-L-E -E -E Hives. And that uh, YouTube channel only has 555 subs. But what they do have is a very good uh, demonstration of an American version of these uh, Slovenian hives, AZ hive setup, and they sell them, by the way. So I looked in on them, I looked in on their Facebook page. I haven't seen any posts from them since 2021. Not that long ago, but I'd like to see something more current. But uh, that's the shout out today to go and check that out. And if you want to see at least what the hives look like, I think he did a very good job of explaining it and showing you what's going on. And I think you can buy a hive. I looked at their website, $555 for the hive. It's quite a bit of woodwork in there, and it is a different way of keeping your bees. So if you're interested, that's a good place to look. I'm not endorsing them. I'm just uh, giving you a place to go and look because I sent them a message on Facebook, and I tried to follow the links or contact information that doesn't seem to be active right now. So... I don't know what's going on with them, but that's a great place to go. They've got some videos up. For those of you who are wondering what it is, there are, I'm sure, several other websites, but this one we can drop in. That's my shout-out for today to check them out. And their actual website is called thebeeshop.com. So you can check that out, too. We want to see what their pricing is like. But again, I've never used them. Don't have any interaction with them. Uh, like I said, I sent messages, but that was today. So it's last minute stuff. Next question is number two. Rachel Stone. In Western Australia, we're not allowed to leave honey frames out for the bees to clean up before we stack them away for winter. I have a deep brood box plus medium for bees on all my hives. Now as we can have a summer dearth as well as a winter one. So taking your advice here already. So I've just got my flow supers to remove and was wondering what are your thoughts? And what your thoughts would be as to how best to empty them without breaking the rules. So when it comes to any of your honey supers that you're not going to leave on, because when it gets to fall and the cold weather starts to come, that's when we finish taking off the last uh, surplus honey and we leave honey for the bees. And uh, the stuff that we're not leaving for the bees may not be completely capped. So there's some things that we have to do. Um, we go ahead. I do. I would go ahead and extract uh, the honey, even though now it's going to have a higher water percentage, well over 20% likely, probably 21, 22. Although you could luck out, it could be, you know, a lower water percentage and could be good for extracting. But I pull all the honey off, and if it's a flow super, I drain all of the frames, whatever's left in them, and leave it in the open position. And then let the bees clean that up, the hive that they're actually on. So you don't have to set them out, although... I have historically put them out at robbing stations and let the bees clean everything up. But if that's against the rules where you live, you can put them right back on the same hive because then they're not spreading anything to anybody else and they can uh, clean it up probably better than we can and then go right from that right into storage. Uh, the other thing is when it comes to partially capped frames and things like that, 
I do dehydrate that down. So some people, big beekeepers, have these warming rooms and drying rooms and things like that before they go into processing, but my channel's geared towards backyard beekeepers. So I'm gonna talk about something that I have, in fact, it's only 25 feet from where I'm sitting right now, and that's a, it's called a Vivo Sun. And uh, what it is, is it's uh, designed for inside growing. So it's a completely contained, it comes with a metal frame, and I'm going to give you a link to this down in the video description so you can look at them. They come in different sizes. Mine is 60 inches tall, 32 inches wide, and 80 inches long. And you close them up completely. You can put a dehumidifier in there. And also what I have is a rolling cart, the metal carts with the grids on them. And you can put jars of honey on there. You can put a whole um, medium super on there, or you can pull the frames out, put them on a rack, and then you just run that dehydrator, the dehumidifier. And I have fans that clip to the framework at the top and they just constantly blow and circulate the air because that's what the bees are doing. Honeybees don't have dehydrators. They uh, move the air around and that dries off uh, through the air movement. It dries off the water and starts to condense their honey down until it's at a high um, concentration to where it can no longer ferment. So that's your goal. And I highly recommend that uh, if you don't already have one, you get a refractometer. Because you may find that even with some of those cells uncapped, when you put it all together, uh, you may have a, a nice low... Uh, moisture content in that honey but I have that room and it took it down almost two percent moisture wise per day so per 24 hour period and when you put a dehumidifier in there and this is a standard household dehumidifier that you buy Walmart Amazon wherever you shop and uh, even when it's not actively dehumidifying it blow you can put the fan on high so that helps with the air movement but it also heats up the air and I put a uh, thermometer and a humidity sensor in there so that I know what's going on in that space. But they come with a floor, the walls, the top, and they have little cutouts in it so that you can add ventilation, which I don't use because I want to dry everything out. So I'm not, if you had plants, you would be bringing in CO2 and moving the air around to keep your plants alive and healthy. But it works great as a dehumidifier. So that's what I recommend. And then, of course, put it out on the hive that you took it off of because we're already at the end of the year. Nectar flows ended, so they're not going to start filling those cells again. They'll just clean everything up and it'll be empty. And that's when you pull it off and then you go to storage with it. So that's what I'm thinking. It's a good way to go. And having a dehumidifier like that, it works too when you, if you've drawn off honey, you already put it into jars, for example, but uh, they seem a little high to you. In fact, if you're going to put uh, honey jars in there that are high anyway, and you're going to run that system in that space, uh, then you can go ahead and put your other jars in there too and just pull the lids off because dust doesn't blow around because it's a completely enclosed Vivo Sun system. So people grow plants in there year round. Question number three, moving on. Harvey Schumann, West Long Branch, New Jersey. And uh, for those of you speaking of New Jersey, I posted a uh, interview with Frank Mortimer about his book, Beekeepers, Bee People, and the Bugs They Love. So if you haven't seen that, you might check that out. He said that New Jersey is the most populated, most densely populated state. Pretty interesting. But anyway, I'm on a rooftop. I'm a rooftop beekeeper and have been using the Hive Alive fondant as a supplement this winter. In fact, I'm beginning my third round of patties. I started in the middle of January and put my second round on middle of February and in about 10 days they devoured all of the fondant and then put on the third round last Monday. Performing swarm control, I put my honey supers on usually the first or second week of April and uh, instead of liquid feed, do you think I can leave the fondant on until the supers are on? Of course, once uh, the honey supers are on, I will pull off the fondant because we don't want that in your honey super anyway. I'm going to pull one of these fondant pieces up. This is what we're talking about. A lot of people using it this year. Hive Live fondant. In fact, uh, side note, yesterday I went around to all the different hives to see how much fondant they used. 
and none of them finished my hive alive fondant. None of them, not one colony. And they're all flying, they're all doing great. And the one that consumed the most ate a space about this size, you know. So not even half of it. So I, you know, my bees didn't take it, uh, but they're all alive, they're all doing well, but I can't totally credit that to the hive life fondant because they didn't really consume the fondant. Some of them only ate a little bit past uh, the cutaway and that was it. So, but here, uh, you put them out and could you leave them on? Sure, you can leave them on, let the bees use them up. Uh, we did an interview with Dara Scott who uh, invented Hive Alive and he's the, he's the owner of that company. What you can do at the end of the year, if you want the syrup available, is you can take those packets out and you can rinse them with warm water and just create a syrup with it. So you can pull those packs out, make a syrup with the fondant that's left over. And if it's too watery, then you can add a little sugar to that, add sucrose, and it just becomes a good boost for them in the spring. Or as mentioned, you can just leave it on as a pack. So choice is yours. Do it either way. And of course, don't leave, uh, don't be feeding syrup and don't be, uh, as said here, don't leave your fondant on when you're gonna put your honey supers on that are gonna be used for human consumption. We want that to come from plants. We want that to come from flowers, the good stuff. Next thing comes from T Video. This is question number four. Several different colored bees there. Looks like that swarm consisted of a mix of genetics. Is that odd? No, it's not odd. And here's the thing, and I'm glad that question was asked because when you're looking at your beehive, you may think, well, these are drifters. Look, some of these bees are really blonde looking and others look really dark. And these are the workers inside the hive. How does that happen? Keep in mind that when the Virgin Queen flies out and she mates, she mates with a bunch of different drones. So you end up with mixed genetics and you can end up with worker bees that look very different from one another. Lots of studies and observations have been done about that too. And uh, they do identify other workers with their own genetics and they tend to cluster together and work together and things like that. It's pretty interesting stuff. But yeah, that they can be from the same queen. It just means they have different fathers, different drones. And uh, so they can physically appear different. Now they could be a result of drifting, but you will always have a whole bunch of half sisters inside your hive. So pretty interesting stuff. Yep, that's why you see the differences. Now drones, you see some ridiculous looking drones are all different colors because drones just go anywhere they want. They don't even, you know, they don't follow that rule. So they actually could be from different colonies. But when it comes to the workers, it's perfectly normal to see a bunch of different uh, colors and traits and things like that because of their genetics are different. Question number five from Bill Bird. I'm so new to the game that I'm only now getting ready to receive my first order of bees, but doesn't your video show the hazard of having an improperly engineered excluder? Weren't the holes simply made too small? Does this really support the notion of not using excluders at all? I mean, a drunk carpenter can make every door in a house so narrow that one no one could pass through. Just asking. And this is because many years ago, I did queen excluder tests. And uh, what I did was, and the reason I'm gonna mention the method is because this is a great thing for you to do in your own backyard. And uh, what I like to do is when I come up with a practical backyard beekeeping test that is informative, it's also great for grandkids and your own kids and anybody that has a curious mind that wants to come up with a method to answer a question you might have. How many bees aren't making it through your queen excluder. And then we know, as mentioned in this question, that's a plastic queen excluder and there are metal queen excluders. Well, it's easy to take out calipers and measure the open space between them. But the design, of course, is to make sure that queen bees don't get through the excluder, but the workers can. So the question that came to me was, can workers really get through it? And if they can, do all workers get through it or do some of them find themselves left out? So here's the test. So if you've got a medium super, just a medium box, you can set that out on a table. In fact, I highly recommend you put two of them out there or however, however many queen excluder designs you have. And then you put them out there and you put a 
source of syrup there. So you put a feeder out. Now I use those yellow quart feeders that you see in all my videos that I do my testing for. And you make sure, of course, all the syrups, it, it's not critical what the composition of the syrup is, but I use one-to-one -one for these tests. And you let the bees come and go from those syrup offerings day after day, and they spread that information to all the other bees. And pretty soon you have hundreds, if not thousands of bees coming to each of these boxes, each of these syrup sources for several days. So now because what that does is they return to known sources before they do anything else. And this is a great time of year to do it because your honey supers are likely not on. So you could do this experiment. And when you do it, write your comments down below this video because it's very interesting. And I think you're going to be surprised. Once the bees are going regularly, of course, you get out there before sunrise, before the foragers are out and trying to get the syrup. And you put your queen excluders on there. What's a queen excluder look like? This is a queen excluder, one of the plastic ones. Oh man, I thought I had a whole bunch of them. This is a type of queen excluder, a metal one. This is another metal one over here. My favorite one, by the way, if I were putting a queen excluder on, this is a really well-made queen excluder. This is a fantastic experiment to do. So put a different style queen excluder on each of those medium supers. Now get out there and watch the bees come and see the frustrated foragers at the entrance at the queen excluder that can't get down there to the syrup. Bumblebees, of course, can't get in and things like that but it's very informative you're going to see that a large percentage of the bees struggle and struggle and struggle and can't get through it so even on the very best day even with bees able to get through when they have to squeeze their bodies through queen excluders this should help inform you regarding what kind of queen excluder you want to use some of the plastic ones have sharp edges on them and there's wear and tear physically on the bees as they push through the queen excluder. And uh, so that's one of the reasons I ended up not using queen excluders. And uh, you can do these tests yourself. So it's not just Fred who made something up that isn't real, that didn't happen, and probably that queen excluder was made bad. Test it for yourself. Very easy to do. And I think you're going to be very surprised. Question number six comes from Michael Hall. Let's see, you mentioned beekeeping hive app. Please, have you done anything regarding a video on the app? And if you yourself use an app, please would you demonstrate what you use it for? And so this is regarding beekeeping apps, which is interesting because guess what happened? I do, I use two apps that I'm testing just for fun. One is Bee Scanning, which is the app that uh, helps you identify. Now it identifies brood disease as well, but it's supposed to show you when there are phoretic mites. Those are mites that are not in pupa cells and they're out on the bodies of the bees, uh, which actually does a pretty good job of showing that. And it can help you identify a colony that has an infestation of varroa destructor mites and requires treatment right away. Although my discussion has always been that if you don't see any mites on the app, which you use your cell phone for, uh, it doesn't mean that you should consider it clear. So that might be one that you do a sugar roll or you do a uh, alcohol wash or a soap wash, whichever you prefer, and then to verify that your mite numbers are low. But if you find a lot of mites with the app, because then you can zoom in and, and see them right there, uh, then you know that that's a colony that may require treatment and uh, so on. So the bee scanning app is one that I've done and it's in my horizontal, the long Langstroth hive sequences. There's a web page on fredsfinefowl.com uh, which has that demonstration. It has all my horizontal hive videos put together on one page. So you can see that. But another one that I started using last year was a way to keep records for beekeeping and it was really interesting and it seemed progressive and they were doing good stuff. And it was called Beekeep Pal. And then the weirdest thing happened, I go to find it on my phone uh, because it was an app on my phone. It was only good for Android and uh, not there. Not only that, all my data is not there. Not only that, I paid my $96 for the year. 
So now I'm a little concerned about the company and I went to their Facebook page, Beekeep Pal, and they have the Facebook page, it's still up and running, but uh, there have been no entries on that page since 2021. And uh, I went to the main website and I logged in there and I could see that they got my money, $96 for the year, and uh, none of my data is there. So something's going on with them. So if you know what's going on with Beekeep Pal, uh, share it with me down in the comments section. So here's the other thing I can't share with Michael here, what my preferred um, inventory system is, hive inspection system is when it comes to a digital app. I will say that uh, it saves me a lot of time because if you're in your bee suit or you're wearing a jacket or a shirt with nice pockets, uh, you can carry your phone with you all the time. And when you're looking at a hive, the way this app works is you, you photograph the hive in its current condition and configuration. And then you enter your information, the queen and everything else. So you can keep track of your stuff very easily unless all your data goes away, as mine did. So that's a little bit frustrating. It's weird. I mean, it disappeared, just disappeared from my phone. And uh, I could find nothing else except for the fact that I still had a current account with them and uh, that I had paid my dues. And uh, the next payment due date was March. Well, I canceled so because I can't get any information from them. So what I'm going to do is open this up for discussion down in the comment section below this video. If you do use a phone app for your hive inspections and for inventorying your equipment or um, you know, cataloging how much honey you got or when you feed or when you treat and all of these things. Those are all valuable bits of information to have at your fingertips. And I did like the Beekeep Pal. They sent you an email uh, when you're at the third week uh, when you haven't reported something on a specific hive. So again, really good for backyard beekeepers. Probably super annoying if you're a commercial beekeeper uh, because there are just so many hives. You don't need to be notified when each individual hive requires a look-see. So I've lost my recommended beekeep pal. I'm a little bit embarrassed that I even recommended it in the first place. If they've quit on us, I can find no information. So if you have a favorite one, let me know what it is because I'd like to check it out myself now because now I find myself looking for it. What are the alternatives though? Old school people. I have a huge three ring binder. And you can, um, there's lots of them. So if you Google, and hive inspection forms. They have forms that are in public domain that you can download, they're MS Word, you can print them out, and they're pretty comprehensive. So, and there was also a small yellow book that uh, had hives on it with 10 frame uh, Langstroth boxes and all the codes that you write on the frame. So when you do your inspections, it was a weatherproof flip book. Those things were actually really expensive. So you can keep your own records, but you gotta have them with you. And of course, write things down on the spot, on location, because what happens is we get back and we forget. Some people like to write things on the hives themselves. Nothing wrong with that. There's also nothing wrong with, there are these tags that have zip ties on them and they're all weather tags, they're plastic. And you can take a Sharpie and you can write the date of your inspection, things you noted, and things like that right on that. And when you pull the outer cover, put that tag right in there and close it back up. So the next time you visit that hive, you open it and it's got your notes on what you noticed last. And because it's not paper, they last a long time. And of course, when you fill up one side, you flip it. I find that those will last you a whole year. And uh, of course, identifying your hives with a number, even though you only have two hives or three hives or whatever, you don't know how many hives you're gonna have down the road so by having hive numbers on your hives in an indelible way so that you can keep records, um, and then you'll know years from now that you know hive number three has been there for however long, but it gives you a correlation. So hive number three, what kind is it? Langstroth, what kind of frames are you using? What kind of foundation did you use? What kind of bees did you put in it? Was it a swarm? Were they packages? Did you do a split? All these things that we think we're gonna remember, but you can easily forget. So, I think that's about it for that one. Now, question number seven comes from Fred Stewart, Miamisburg, Ohio. I'm in my fourth year of beekeeping, and historically, I went into winter using two double deeps. So double deeps are deep frame boxes. And uh, at spring, I uh, 
would then rotate the boxes to move the bees so they would be in the bottom box. This year, for three of my hives, I shrunk down the size of the boxes to one deep and one medium filled with honey. That's my configuration now here in my hives. I haven't opened up my hives yet, but all the hives so far seem to have made it through winter, and I expect that when I open the hives next weekend for my initial inspection, that the queen will be up into the medium and likely have some brood up there. What do you recommend to get the queen back into the bottom box? Rotate the medium to the bottom and then the deep to the top, or just leave them as they are? Okay, so it's true in spring, although things are really kicking right now, but in spring, they do move up because they moved up during the winter time into your upper box. So if you're in a two box, configuration, whether it's two deeps or a deep and a medium or a deep and two mediums. Some people do practice pulling those upper boxes and rotating them and making them the bottom box and then the other box goes up and the theory then is that your bees will work up as the year progresses and they'll start to store their resources higher up in the box. And there are a lot of things that I do that help those bees to move down and I can tell you right off the bat I don't rotate the boxes so I don't split them I'm not going to put a medium box on the bottom and a deeper box on top. I do have a couple that have uh, double deeps, but I leave that configuration. And why does it matter if I leave that configuration? Because I don't use either of those bottom two boxes. So whether they're two deeps or deep and a medium, doesn't matter because I'm not going to pull honey off of those. Everything in those bottom two boxes for me is just for the bees. And what they do is they like to use the same areas over and over for brood, but then as summer comes along, they start to store more honey and resources like that in the higher cells, and then they just gradually start to move down because what's at the bottom? The entrance. And what else have I put on most of my hives? Also, there's a two inch spacer that's called a slatted rack. So it's the bottom board, the slatted rack, the deep brood box. That's my standard starting point for all of my Langstroth hives. And then I add a medium super above that. So what it is is that brood box, that old comb and everything, because there's another reason why I don't want to rotate it and uh, is because I use a lot of foundationless frames down there or I use better comb. I use things that probably wouldn't hold up very well during extraction. So if you had a centrifugal extractor, or a tangential extractor, it would not uh, work very well, radial and tangential, either way. Um, so then the upper boxes that are going to be for honey harvesting are always wire reinforced, or they have uh, plastic foundation, or it's a plastic frame with foundation as part of that frame composition, because those can hold up to all kinds of stuff, including power washing. So the bottom two boxes, for me, I don't rotate them because I never change them out. And uh, the bees do move back down eventually. Now that I've said that, some people want to start with an upper entrance or an upper vent when spring comes and summer kicks in. And that's when, of course, they have less encouragement to move back down towards the entrance, which is where the ventilation is, and they like to keep their brood near the ventilation. That's again why when we look at these cutouts that people are doing and you talk to the people that do the cutouts, where's the brood concentrated? Near the entrance. Where's the honey concentrated? Farthest from the entrance. So this is a natural order that the bees will do on their own left to themselves. So they will eventually migrate back down closer to that entrance and they use the frames fuller all the way to the bottom. If there's a slatted rack down there, which creates more space, and then again, the entrance is below the slatted rack. So that draws them down closer to that too. So that's my configuration. Single entrance on the bottom board, no upper vent, no upper entrance. It's also why when they set up that first load of honey up there that generally fills that medium super, um, that's also why above that, I don't have a queen excluder before I put on my honey supers because the queen very rarely goes across capped honey in order to start laying in cells up there unless that bottom box is chock-a-block full and they're near honey bound or something like that. But once they have that brood pattern set up, that's it. And Dr. Seeley even suggests that we don't rotate these boxes because part of your brood will arch up into that second box. And so, 
either way, you're splitting your brood up too. So I leave them. And this is a personal preference. It's just what I do. If you're in the habit of rotating them and that works really well for you, you have to wonder why are you rotating them to prevent them from going even higher? And that's why I also leave that two box configuration until I start filling things up. Not completely. We don't want them honey bound in spring because that's a stimulant for them to swarm. Uh, instead, we let them start to fill those areas and they naturally push themselves down to open and available cells for brood rearing. And that's when we then add the next box after the buildup is occurring and their population is increasing. It's really once you get that rhythm, it's pretty simple to do, but that's what I do and I don't rotate them. And it's why some people have gone to all medium boxes. And that's so that all their equipment's exactly the same. All medium frames, all medium boxes, no interchanging, no running around. You need a deep frame, you need a medium frame, you need a deep box, a medium box, and all this other stuff. They do just mediums. Well, when you do that, I guarantee you that with a medium box on the bottom, and as you get into spring, you're going to have two mediums involved in the brood. So when you do your inspections, you're pulling those boxes apart, you are going to tear apart mid brood. So that's another reason why your bottom box is a deep box because it really closely matches the height that the bees use to expand out through the frames. And then that's a, a height that keeps them closer to the entrance and very little brood gets up into that next box. So you're doing less damage to the infrastructure of the hive when you take it apart for inspections. So I hope that helps. Bryce Bennett says, hello, Fred, thanks for your time. It's approaching 60 degrees Fahrenheit today in central New Hampshire. And I'm doing the first inspection on the Lands Hive, <clears throat> which is booming. And yesterday, last year, what, which was booming yesterday. So last year I observed a European hornet stealing a barn spider's captured wrapped food. Amazing. I thought the hornet was stuck and then it flew away with the stolen food. Later, while walking under the same old sugar maples, I found the hornets entering a knot hole about 30 feet up the trunk and I read that European hornets abandon the nest in the fall. Will they or some other queen reoccupy that nest in the spring? Is the nest cavity acceptable for honeybees and is there any chance honeybees will move into the abandoned hornet's nest? Thanks again. Okay, <clears throat> and that's interesting and it's cool that you even noticed one that was that high up in a maple tree. And uh, European hornets, by the way, I think that's what we're talking about. That's Vespa crabro. And uh, that's, so it's not Mandarinia. Vespa Mandarinia is the murder hornet that's in the Northwestern US right now that they seem to have a handle on it. But uh, the European hornets we see around a lot and that behavior that was described uh, I've seen mud daubers do that too. So those are the black wasps that have the shiny blue um, coloration on them. I saw one of those in a spider web and it acted like it was stuck. And when the spider came out to spin its web around the mud dauber, the mud dauber grabbed the spider and flew away. So that was pretty cool stuff. And it's something that I really want to get documented in a video. Not surprising that the European Hornet uh, found something that was already stuck in the web dead and stole it. They, uh, they feed on carrion, they'll feed on anything. So the question is though, uh, do they reuse their nest? So they really don't in the North. Now see in Southern states where you don't have a really heavy winter, that's why yellow jacket nests just can continue to build and build and build. Because if they don't have a freeze cycle that kills everything off, the nest never gets completely abandoned. So the paper wasp nest continues to build. And European hornets can actually excavate a nest. So when they get in these old dead trees and they get into those, those holes like that where the knot hole was, because I was observing one last year for several months, uh, they chew away at the interior and you see sawdust at the bottom. And uh, so when winter time comes, they don't stay in the nest. So they take off. They create, so the resident queen, the foundress queen, they call her, uh, produce a bunch of drones and a bunch of uh, new queens at the end of the year and they all fly off on their own and they all fly in places to winter and in the spring each of those queens will start a brand new nest. They do not reuse the existing paper wasp nest and that's the hornet nest also. All uh, hornets are wasps, not all wasps are hornets. So 
interesting. We only have one true hornet here in the United States. It's a resident, aside from the murder hornet that's trying to move in, we have uh, the European hornet. So they're actually pretty laid back. I've done videos of them. I try to pick them up. You know, they're fun to play with and they're dramatic when you see them because they're so large. Now, sometimes they'll come in and create a new nest right next to an existing paper wasp nest. Uh, but they won't tear up the existing one, get rid of it and rebuild a new one. And they won't reoccupy an old nest. So that answers that. And if, you've, if they've flown out, if they were in an area and winter came and they left, and you don't want them back in there, it's a great uh, opportunity to seal up that entrance so that uh, hornets don't move back in. And the other part of the question was, would honeybees move into it? But one of the things I noticed with the hornet nest entrances is they seem really large, by the way. There's not a lot to encourage a honeybee to move in there. What's the preferred size cavity for honeybees to move in? 10 gallons. So it'd have to be a pretty sizable nest. I've seen uh, European hornets move into very small spaces. Um, you don't want them in the walls of your house though, because they can chew. Uh, in fact, some people have tried to close up the outside of European hornet nests on the outside of a house and uh, thought that sealing it up would be a good idea or they spray a bug bomb in there only to have those European hornets chew right through the gypsum board, drywall, whatever you want to call it, and end up inside the house getting away from uh, the spray that you just put in there. So watch it. Uh, word to the wise there. But uh, in general, yeah, that's it. Would the honeybees move in if it was a big enough space? But honeybees like to go where honeybees have been. So there's no wax. You remember their, their uh, nest is made out of cellulose. That's why you see them chewing on old fence posts and old untreated barns and things like that. You'll see them in the spring along with other wasps and they're chewing away on the side of the barn. And that's because they're getting the paper, they're getting the wood pulp, and they're going back and they're making their paper nest with it. Which requires constant maintenance if it's at all exposed. Like bald-faced hornets build those out on tree limbs, and you'll see those going up. But I've noticed that the uh, European hornets like to build in cavities. So pretty interesting stuff. So I hope I answered that question. And guess what? That's the last question of the day for now. So an interesting thing that's coming up, there will be more interviews. So thank you for those of you who have written me and said how much you're appreciating the Interviews with Experts series. Uh, we have another one going up tomorrow, and I have a, a whole queue of really interesting people to talk to about beekeeping and bee-related things. So I hope you tune in for those, and I thank you for being here today. I hope you got something out of it, and I hope that the weather's cooperating. For those of you who are down in Australia, uh, I know that you've dealt with some heavy rain and things like that, uh, really unprecedented levels of rain that have wiped out entire apiaries. And uh, we really hope that you get a break down there soon and that you can help each other out. So thanks for being here today and for watching, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again.